A battle for northern Mozambique. ISIL-linked fighters say they're in control of a port close to major gas projects. Thousands have been killed and displaced in years of instability. So, is this the start of a new wave of violence? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Imran Khan. Government forces in Mozambique are fighting to regain control of an area in the north. Soldiers are trying to push back ISIL-linked fighters in Cabo Delgado province. The region's rich in natural resources, but has faced years of attacks and conflict. On Wednesday, fighters took control of the port of Masimba de Praia, which is near offshore gas projects worth $60 billion. The army says it's killed 59 fighters in running street battles. But local media say the soldiers run out of ammunition. The defence ministers accusing the fighters of receiving outside help. The enemy has infiltrated several neighbourhoods, dressed as civilians and benefiting from complicity, attacking the village from the inside, causing destruction, looting and murdering defenceless citizens with sabotage manoeuvres and attacks on naval means of rescue from the ports of Masimba the Praia. Haru Matassa reports from neighbouring Zimbabwe. In May, regional leaders met here in Harare to discuss the crisis in Mozambique. But after hours of talking, there was no concrete agreement on what the region can and should do to assist Mozambique. Leaders will meet again on Monday, and political analysts say this time they're under increasing pressure to actually do something. One of the expectations that one would have uh, uh, seen from our leadership now is a strong high-level fact-finding mission that would have been sent to, to Mozambique. And this is a mix of uh, intelligence, military intelligence, um, political economy analysts and uh, humanitarian experts to try and establish the extent and the gravity of the situation in Cabo de Gado and northern Mozambique. Mozambique's President Felipe Nusi visited the area affected by the violence and he promised to do more to assist people there. There's speculation some other countries in southern Africa could send in troops to assist Mozambique's army. It's happened before in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Lesotho and in Mozambique back when Inamo fighters were causing problems there. Mozambique's government says fighters affiliated to ISIL are responsible for the violence. The area in northern Mozambique is rich in natural gas and some projects are worth more than $60 billion. There's a concern that the fighting could spill over into other countries in the region, similar to what's been seen currently on the continent in the Sahel region and the Horn of Africa. Haru Mutasa for Inside Story. The latest attack on the port town of Masimba de Praia is the third this year. The violence began three years ago and has spread to many areas of the Cabo Delgado region. In that time, monitoring groups say that 1,500 people have been killed and at least 250,000 displaced from their homes. Mozambique's army has a large presence in the region, but support is being provided by private military groups from Russia and South Africa. Analysts say more help is needed from neighbouring countries. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Mozambique's capital, Maputo, Tom Bauka, editor of the news website Zitama, and also in Maputo, Zainada Mishada, a researcher in the Africa division at Human Rights Watch. Welcome to you all. I'd like to begin with you, uh, Tom. You've been uh, covering this story for a while now. You clearly have some insight to share with us. But firstly, I want to start with the obvious question. What group is this? Locally, they're known as Al-Shabaab. They are uh, linked to ISIL, according to the Mozambique government. Um, but that's, not, that's more of an ideological association rather than a practical one. So who are we actually talking about when we talk about this actual group? Um, it's still not really known with full confidence um, <clears throat> to what extent it's uh, a, a local group that was uh, formed locally, has its, has its origins locally, to what extent it's influenced from the outside through the Islamic State, through Islamic State offshoots in uh, DR Congo in particular, Uganda, Tanzania, potentially up to Somalia, where um, people are making links, but that could just be because of the name Al-Shabaab. There, you know, uh, there's some confusion around that as well. But um, yeah, it's, 
it, it's a it's a matter of ongoing study and debate, I think, exactly who, who these people are and, and, and indeed what they want. But what's absolutely clear, though, is this group is taking advantage of internal conflicts within uh, Mozambique, internal grievances within Mozambique, much like Boko Haram, much like Al-Shabaab. What they're doing is they're offering people who are at their poorest an alternative to come and fight. Is it very much local, though? Or do you think there are outside influences, like the Mozambique government says? Um, I think there probably is a bit of each, but you're definitely right that um, it's it's feeding off of uh, local grievances and and um, you know deep-seated unhappiness with uh, the way Mozambique has developed um, and the exclusion I think that people in uh, the northern province of Cabo Delgado feel from from the development of Mozambique, such as it is, which I mean even. The rest of Mozambique and the richer parts where I am are hardly hardly rich by most of the world's standards. But um, yeah, Cap Delgado, as you say, it, the, the insurgency can feed off, off existing grievances there among the people, for sure. Uh, Zanada Mashada in uh, Maputo as well. What do you think? What do you think is driving a group like this within Mozambique? You, 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 like, like Tom said, I mean, there are many things that are driving a group like this, but one for sure makes it easier for them to operate is the fact that this is a country full of young people who have been marginalized from the system, who feel excluded from the political decisions, from the economic decisions, from the social decisions as well. Um, and Cap Delgado is not different. Um, and I think in the in Cap Delgado, the sentiment is even bigger because these young people can see uh, what is going on in the province in terms of huge investment, multinationals arriving, certain areas getting development while others don't. Um, as to some of them, their main source of income, which was what we call artisanal mining, has been removed from them to give space to the multinationals to do their own exploration. Um, and, uh, um, of course, there are also historical elements, tribal divergences uh, um, in the region, and all of those elements have made it easier for such group to penetrate, recruit, and somehow begin to make the gains that we are seeing in the, in the past few months. Uh, but, Zanardo, it is interesting that you say that, you know, this is a very much a local issue, but we are hearing uh, that this is being exploited by fighters from neighbouring countries. Are you convinced it is a local issue only, or do you think that it has the potential to spread as an insurgency? Well, at this stage, I'm not convinced of anything, because I think all of us are trying to understand what exactly is going on in Cap Delgado. One thing I can assure you is that if there were not elements of discontent internally, whatever group from outside will not ever will never find space to operate in a country like Mozambique. Um, the way this group is operating in Cap Delgado is clearly a group that understands the terrain in some cases better than the army forces. Um, it's a group that understands the language, that understands the culture, and in some cases understands the religion as well. So it means that if this is an external interest, if these are external people somehow, um, like the president said yesterday, that is people that are trying to divide us because of our wealth, uh, in whether case you cannot divide a house that is united, isn't it? Uh, so they were able to find in Mozambique a fertile terrain, people who are discontent, people who can be offered any type of money to join the group, People who identify themselves with the ideas as well, with the objectives of the group, which we don't know what they are at this time, at this stage. But uh, the reason why the group has been able to make the gains it has been made to make uh, in areas of very difficult access. I have been into those regions. I mean, you drive for about an hour or more without seeing houses inside the bush. And by the time you arrive to a village, you know that these groups have already been into those villas. So it means they know the terrain very well. They know how to walk around those regions. They are locals. Whether their leadership is local or from abroad, that's a question that I won't be able to answer in this conversation. Well, Tom, let me bring you in here. 
There are shades of 2014 and the takeover of Mosul in Iraq, second largest city there, uh, by ISIL fighters. They went in, they took it, that city over, and what they did was they routed the security forces here. Here in capital Garda, we are hearing that the, um, the army just ran out of ammunition, that they were forced out. Uh, were they expecting, were you expecting another, uh, an attack of this nature, of this size? Or was this a surprise to both Mozambique and to people who observe it? I don't think it was a surprise. I think we've uh, learned over recent months, or it's been reasonable to conclude that the insurgents want to take Masimba de Praia or to keep targeting it. I think what will be interesting to see over the coming days and weeks is whether they try and hang on to it. I mean, it was interesting that, yeah, they managed to make the Mozambican forces run out of ammo and supplies, while they themselves, at least according to the defence minister yesterday, were being supplied from bases uh, outside the country, he says, who knows. Um, but yeah, they managed to prevent the Mozambican army actually resupplying itself uh, within Mozambique. So yeah, it was... Um, Probably not a surprise to see them have another Gert Masimbo de Praia, which does seem to be a strategic um, asset for them. What, what doesn't seem to be a target for them, at least so far, and this has been going on for almost uh, three years now, is the big LNG project just to the north. Um, taking Masimbo de Praia will be an impediment to the progress of that project. Uh, but the insurgents haven't targeted the gas, which I think a lot of people kind of assumed when this started, that, that was this was a war over the gas resources. Um, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but as you say, they they seem to want to make uh, Masimbua maybe the capital of, of, of the land that they can carve out for themselves in Cabo Delgado if they're able to do that. And indeed, if that's their aim, I mean, that, this is what we're able to surmise up to now. But the Mozambique authorities are using private security forces, private security companies to help them in this battle. There's helicopters coming in uh, from a number of uh, companies, but it doesn't seem to have worked, does it? I mean, are we at a stage where Mozambique needs an uh, international intervention, much like the one in Iraq and in Syria? Yeah, I think the, um, the private military contractors have probably worked as far as they could, given the limited resources that um, Mozambique has been able to give them, probably. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, I think the, what appears to be, although it's still contested, but it appears to be a, a major defeat in Masimba, uh at the start of this week is, is, a really, is a really poor result for the Mozambican uh, military and their private military contractor... Uh, Dyke advisory groups supporting them as well. So, yeah, it, it, it does seem reasonable to conclude that the only way of turning this around militarily will be through um, international support, um, of which there's no strong sign that there's any on its way, actually. Well, given, Zanada, that we are, the Mozambique government is blaming the Islamic State, blaming ISIL for this, that's a good way of grabbing international attention by saying that we have the Islamic State within our borders. You did it in Iraq, you did it in Syria, you need to help us here now. Do you think that the, the government is looking for international support and that's why it's claiming that this group is linked to ISIL? Um, I think the link between the group and ISIL comes way before the government itself made such claims. Uh, we have seen uh, websites that have traditionally been linked to ISIS claiming to have made military gains in capital cards. Um, but going back to, to, to your question on, on whether the fact that this conflict is linked to ISIS uh, should or not draw more attention from the international community, I think not just because it's ISIS, because we have heard uh, uh, what they can do in other parts of the world. And when you look at the, the limitations Mozambique has as a country, one doesn't want to need we even want to imagine the, the conflict escalating at the stage as, that it is in other places. But, but, but not just because there is a big uh, terrorist group involved in the conflict. I think an important point for the international community to be focused on what's going on in Mozambique is the scale of humanitarian disaster that seems to be uh, looming. I mean, we are talking about a very poor country that has just come out. And those areas where, mind you, those areas that have been affected by, 
by this COVID are the same areas that were affected by Cyclone uh, Kennedy just last year. So we are talking about over 200,000 people displaced, over 900 uh, people dead, um, over 100 schools that have been affected by this conflict, houses that are burned down almost in every attack that we see, um, over 500 attacks. I mean, this is a scale of, of, of destruction that it's going to be very hard for the Mozambican government to fix on its own. It needs help. And I, and I think uh, uh, the story we are hearing about what people are suffering in the camps that they managed to run to, we are hearing about outbreaks of cholera, for example, in the times of COVID-19. So there is a lot for the Mozambican government to manage at this stage. And of course, it can't do it alone. It needs help. Uh, why the government has not clearly and openly made, made that uh, request to their partners, um, it's an answer that I don't know. Um, I, I have tried to find out. Uh, the government insists it can manage things on their own. We know that they have requested privately uh, some humanitarian help, but we also know that some humanitarian groups are, are leaving those areas. For example, Makumia and Mosimba da Praia are areas that people have almost been left on their own, and they are running away. They are hiding themselves in the bush without any food, clothes, or any shelter. Um, I think it's time the international community pays the attention that it needs to, not just from the humanitarian angle, but also on the human rights uh, angle that is uh, a problem at this stage. Tom, would you agree that, uh, with our with our guest, um, Zainardo uh, de Machado, like, would you agree that, that actually it does need more international support? It does need more international cooperation. However, before you answer that one, let me tell you, I mean, we have a, a gas project there worth $60 billion. There seems to be money that they could use to fix the country. So I guess the question is, is that why and should they have international cooperation? Um, yeah, Mozambique is not, uh, has not monetized that gas yet. It's not, it's not rich yet from the gas. Um, Total, which are, is running one of the two uh, projects up there, has just signed uh, financing worth uh, $15 billion, I think, for I'm getting my numbers wrong there, but it's in the region of that, um, for, the, for the project. So, yeah, banks have lent to the project, and I think the project has got the money to defend itself, probably, um, and to contribute to Mozambique's effort. But I think, yeah, Mozambique, I mean, Mozambique has historically had a pretty weak military, um, which was unable to defeat Renamo during a long running civil war and has um, arguably been weakened even since the end of that in the mid 90s. Um, it's it, 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 it's at the it's at the limit of its um, ability now. It seems. I mean, they, we're, we hear they're sending um, huge amounts of reinforcements northwards now to Cabo Delgado. I mean, it's uh, I guess it, it seems incredibly late to start doing that. But but yes, that's the that's the seriousness where we're at. But it, it does seem unlikely that the Mozambicans can really turn this around on their own. So I I do think. Um, Militarily, they'll need they'll need help, but also, as, uh, as Anida says, the humanitarian situation is extremely, extremely serious. And, um, but and Tom, again, that's actually uh, making the humanitarian situation that Zanada was talking about makes it a very fertile recruiting ground, uh, ground for disaffected people, disaffected youth who are looking at the failures of the government and looking for a group that represents their interests. I mean, much more than just you can't mm. defeat. ISIL militarily, we've seen that in Syria and in Iraq, you can defeat them on the ground, but the ideology remains if there is still um, anger from local youth. Now, there seems to be that anger there. So it's not just about the military, it's about the ideology as well. How in Mozambique can you fight that ideology if there simply isn't the will to do it? Yeah, um, it's... Um, the, the war for hearts and minds in Cabo Delgado is going to be incredibly important in the in the long-running fight against uh, IS or whoever these people are. Um, and you do fear that the Mozambican authorities are squandering that somewhat. The the police and military are violating human rights of civilians up there. I mean, obviously, 
the biggest threat to civilians over the last few years has been the insurgents. And, um, you know, I think uh, they've not garnered much sympathy. But recently, there's been signs that the insurgency have been trying to win hearts and minds of locals. Um, and like I say, the, the Mozambican defense forces have not been doing a very good job of securing those hearts and minds for, for the state side. Um, so, yeah, you make an important point that, that that's something that the Mozambican authorities are going to have to address as well, because, like you say, it's, it's difficult and not impossible to win this kind of war militarily in the time. Uh, Zanada, you face a dual challenge then, don't you, when it comes to human rights abuses uh, within Mozambique itself. You've got the one hand the insurgent group making their own human rights abuses, but then you've got the government as well not supporting uh, and perhaps not adhering to human rights standards. I mean, what are the, 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 the main differences between the two? What are the challenges that you face? I think... Um while one side is committing those abuses as a strategy of war, I'm talking about the insurgent group, the other side will commit those atrocities uh, maybe at times as a strategy and uh, most times for lack of knowledge of their obligations on the ground. Um, and let me give you a, a, an example of how uh, the, the government forces human rights abuses, for example, happen. Um, the, the recent attack in Mosimbo da Praia. I mean, Mosimbo da Praia, it's true that most of the, the inhabitants of the, of the town of Mosimbo da Praia have left the place uh, following the two previous uh, attacks, one in March and the other one in June. But there's still people living there. And um, ever since the, 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 the insurgents arrived at the place and the government is now telling us that they were dressed as civilians, which is also a problem because it raised questions about the ability of the soldiers to differentiate between who are the insurgents and who are the civilians. But going back to my point, ever since they arrived at the town, there's been no effort from the security force to protect the locals. These people have been left on their own. They are running away on their own. They are finding sh um, shelter uh, in the bush. Some of them have been living in the bush, as a matter of fact, since March. There is no process of helping them to get to camps where they can find safety, shelter, food, clothing, and so on. Uh, those who manage to get to places in Metuji and Ibo or Pemba, where the main uh, refugee camps are, they go there on their own. And those who cannot make, they decide to stay in the bush and control their residences and their properties from afar. So the people that are being taught in, in, in between uh, fighting as we speak are the same people who were there in March and June, and they receive no help from the government. They're on their own. And, and I think if the government wants to make sure that it's got the trust of those residents, it has to start by stepping up their efforts to protect civilians. Uh, civilians Tom Barker, cannot just be very, very quickly, because we are running out of time, but I do want to ask you this question. As somebody who's covered uh, this uh, quite extensively, we're in a situation where one hand washes the other, where there are human rights abuses by the government, humanitarian crisis, and that feeds the insurgency. Very quickly, is Mozambique equipped to deal with an escalation if they decide to not just deal with the port, but to move on to the LNG facility as well? Um, I think the LNG facility itself is pretty well defended. Um, my understanding is that the gas companies up there pay the Mozambican Defence and Security Forces to give them particular protection. Um, and not only that, they pay their own security companies as well. Uh, I suppose the proof of that pudding will be in the eating if, if there is an attack on the on the gas installation. Um, but, I, but I think it, it's seen as pretty well, uh, pretty well defended, experts think, at the moment. But then again, the scale of the recent attack on Musimba, um, analysts say there were a thousand insurgents, I think, uh, took everyone by surprise as well. So all bets are somewhat off, I think, at this stage. 
I want to thank all our guests, Tom Barker and Zenaido Machado. And thank you too for watching. You can see the programme again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can also join the conversation on Twitter. We're at AJ Inside Story. From me, Imran Khan, and the entire team here in Doha, bye for now.